Hey! Uh, hello, hello, hello. Um, I'm Ben. I'm also known on the internet as Xerox. Uh, this is my face, apparently. I really like JavaScript. Um, I have a website thing. I did not forget to record my screen, which is, I think, a world first. And I think that's quite enough about me. Uh, let's talk about the getter setter hierarchy. So as Benji said, we're sort of going to talk uh, about the nature of values. We're going to talk a bit philosophical. Uh, we're going to start out with four. Uh, I chose four because it's my favorite number and because it's the best number, I think. And we're sort of going to build up from that uh, into collections, callback promises. Maybe we'll even reach streams and observables. By the way, uh, there are going to be points in the talk where I'm going to ask a question, shut up. Um, please, if if you feel like talking, uh, do a comment. I'll I'll try and uh, you know see where this goes. So let's talk. Let's start with something that is very non-controversial. So we have this object like a config, and we have an API port. And that's nice, very nice API port. And we also have a function get config, which pretty much returns the same object. So I'm gonna start with a very uh, you know obvious question: Why do we need functions? Like why have both of these things? Like, why not just this is simpler? Why not have always use values in objects? Why do we need functions? So, what I'm gonna so one thing that you can say is that well, if I have like something like uh, twenty lines of functions. So let's say I have a function that's like 20 lines long. Um, that if I call the function in, in several places, then it's just, you know, I save a lot of space. But that's not a reason, that's not like you can have a preprocessor do that for you. You don't need a function to do that. Um, so really object reuse, or, or sorry, sorry, function reuse is like sort of a nice thing to have, but it's not a must. Uh, if we have some inlines function until we have just like one giant file, then it's sort of equivalent to not having functions. So what is impossible to do without functions? In this talk, I'm gonna f there, there's a lot of things <laughs> actually. Uh, one of them is to quote me in your CRs. Like if you link to this video at this specific point in time and tell everyone to shut up to like close it after four seconds, you can say, oh, I didn't use function because this guy told me not to. But in this talk, we're going to focus on two aspects. When we don't care how something is done, and when the value we're talking about is somewhere else. We're going to see example of that pretty soon. But first, I want to divide functions into two general categories. The first is a getter, which is a function which returns a value. And the second is a setter, which is a function which receives a value. So what are some examples of getters? Day.now is a getter. We don't really have access to the internal clock without day.now. We can reach into the system clock and have, like we don't have the value, what is the time? We need to ask someone, please give it to us. So that's sort of the thing about, you know, value somewhere else that, that is unreachable to us without the help of some getter. Require. So nodes require. We pass in some module and we get back this object. Now, we don't care how require works. It can change tomorrow and we wouldn't care for like 99.999% of the cases. We just don't care how require works. And also, we just, there are some things that require does that we can do. For example, nodes built in modules. Without a way for node to give us, for example, FS, we wouldn't be able to access them since a lot of them is compiled in, into Node. Now, other examples can be like everything over the network, the file system, ROM, uh, process boundaries, shared memory, anything that is outside of our process, we cannot reach un unless we ask for it. Something else is just you know simply user input. Let's say that you have a hangman game and you have the you know the word, let's say goat. 
how how would you put that in into a program without asking for it? It's somewhere else, literally. It's inside your user's brain. You need a way to ask for it. So some setters could be anything that really changes the world. So console log is a very simple setter, example of a setter. It changes you know, your screen. It changes the value there. And also here, we both really don't care how console log works, really. And we also like don't have a way of writing directly to the screen. We, it's just not available to us unless we ask someone for it. Same for element set attribute. We don't care how you know the DOM function and how the inside of a browser works. We don't care. And unless the browser gives us a way to change attributes, we also can't do that. And really a bunch of the same things. Everything over a network, anything over a file system, anything that changes something over there. So if we combine these two aspects, we have something that I like to think about as a box value. We have our x, which is four, objectively, but the best number. And if we just did that, we just had an empty return, like nothing. If you call value, nobody in this universe could access x, nobody. You would be the only one in the universe and x would be very, very lonely. That makes me sad. So if we have a getter here, we can have someone else access our value, our box value. Now, notice that it also gives them access to X, but also gives them apathy. They don't know if X is actually eight, and in the return, we have X over two. They don't know, they don't care, they shouldn't. Similarly for the setter. So this here we could do, you know, you can only set the value door after work hours. For example, that could be a logic here. We could put analytics here we can do whatever we want and there is this apathy in the color now you may be wondering like okay so that's nice but who cares so let's start walking up the setter hierarchy and we're going to begin with callbacks so let's take a function like read config read configs accept a call accepts a callback sorry and we have our lovely config object and we call the callback with our config very nice. Let's look at the signatures. So callback is a function which receives a value and doesn't return anything. That's a setter. Now let's look at read config. It's a function that receives a value and doesn't return anything. That's also a setter. So really read config is a setter of setters. It's a setter which receives another setter. Okay, that's nice and everything, that's a lot of the definitions. Um, what I want to point out now is that we have several kinds of setters. Setters, For example, let's say that we have uh, our x value. It starts off with zero, and whenever we call the callback, it increments. Now let's take something like read file. Read file takes a path and a callback and calls the callback. If you just saw these two things, and waited in time like 10 seconds or whatever, what would you expect the value of x to be? So you'd sort of expect it to be one, right? Since the callback is, you know, supposed to be called and you expect it to be called once and you don't expect it to be called more than once or less than once. So there's a sort of expectation about how the setter of setters is supposed to behave. Like, it, like for, uh, in this point, we talked about how it's only supposed to be called once, but that's not all of our setter of setters. For example, an event listener. An event listener also is a setter of setters, since it's a setter which receives another setter, a callback. But in here, we don't really know what the value of X is gonna be. It's, it depends on how many times the event is called. So, and here we see this like two expectations from our setter of setters, and we're gonna focus on the first of setter of setters, which are just supposed to be called once. Now, in node land, we call that node max. It's sort of a social contract. Like if you think about it, whenever you pass the callback to most node functions, like everything in FS, most things in like streams, DBs, whatever, then you sort of ex you sort of expect the callback to be called just a once. 
Furthermore, you now know of the existence of errors. Since the callback, if there is an error, the callback is called if the first parameter is the error. But if there is no error, that value is null and you receive the value as a second parameter. Now, again, so we have this like two expectations. Uh, yeah, two expectations. So the first is that our callback is called exactly once, no more, nor le no less. The other is that the first argument is the error and the second argument is the value. There is also sort of this third uh, agreement about Zalgo, but we don't not talk about Zalgo here. So let's take this a step further. A lot of small, smart people uh, came together and said, hey, this is like a thing. This is like a thing that we can have an abstraction over. That's a promise. A promise is a setter of setters with some sort of contract. So it's not really a social construct, it's a data structure. Now, let's begin by looking at how you feed a value into a promise, this, since it's also different from node back. So if we look at a node back, our way of passing a value is to our callback is, well, okay, so if we have an error, we call that in. But if we don't have an error, we put in null and the value is in the second argument. In a promise, you have two separate functions for that. So the function you pass into promise is known as a resolver function, and that in turn receives two other functions. If you have a value, you call resolve, and the, val and the promise is fulfilled. If you have an error, you call reject, and the promise is rejected. Now, I'm going to do this magic trick again. Let's look at the signature. Resolve is a function which receives a value. Reject is a function which receives a value. Resolver is a function which receives two values. So the resolver is a setter of two setters. Now let's now look at how you take things out of a promise. If we had the getter and the setter inside of our value and the getter took things out and the setter put things in, in the promise, the resolver, it's what puts things in and the denable is what takes things out. So we have promise.den, and little known fact, but it receives, it actually can receive two functions. One is when the value is fulfilled, as when the promise is fulfilled, and the other when the promise is rejected. And this again is a setter of two setters. Okay, so I said like setter of two setters 10,000 times. So let's uh, sort of uh, take a break from setters and talk about getter of getters. Let's look at a very, there is no like, to my knowledge at least, general name for them, like a sexy name like callbacks. But let's look at an example. Uh, so let's say we have an iterate function. What it does is it declares some values, an array and an index, and it returns an, a function. Now, what the function does, it, it takes a value at the ith index, increments the i, then returns the value that we took out. And how it's used, we call iterate, we get back a function. When we call that function, we get each element in the array in turn. Now we can see from the signature here that iterate is a getter, since it receives no arguments, returns a value. And the, and the function it returns is also a getter. It receives no arguments, returns a value. Now, let's look at what's missing here. Like what, also when we look at the setter, et cetera, we saw that there was some assumption that got broken. What's, what's missing here? Like what's the bug that's waiting to happen? So one possible thing is just what happens if you call get item again? You get back undefined, but what's undefined? Like, is it the next value in the array? Is it an error? Is it supposed to happen? Um, I don't know. Like, that depends on, we don't really have a contract with our getter of getters. We don't know. So termination is what I'd say is the missing contract around this getter of getters. And so a getter of getters with this sort of contract is an iterator. So the signature here is weird. So an iterator is a function. When you call it, you get back 
a value, an object with a next method. When you call that next function, you receive back another object. And you have the value, which is the value that you currently have. And done, which signifies whether um, the iteration has completed. Let's look at how it's going to be done with an iterator. So same thing, a bit more code. We're still, we still have our initialization. And we return an object with the next method. Now we check whether we've out, we're out of bounds. When we are, we return done true. Signify, OK, I'm done here. Then exactly the same, we get our, our value, increment our index. And then we return an object with our current value and done false. Signify we're not done yet. How is this used? So you call iterate and you get back something with a next method. You call next, you get the next value, call next, then the other one, and then the next, and you're done, nothing more. So something around this is the generator. The generator is sort of a syntax trigger for supplying values. Uh, it's function star, part of um, ES2015. And what it actually sort of does is, is allows us to create an iterator without all this boilerplate. So inside of an iterator, when, sorry, inside of a generator, whenever you call yield, it's sort of exactly the same as you know return uh, a value, this value, and done false. And you can see that we call iterate, receives back something of the next method. And that's very nice. We get value, we get a value, we get undefined, done, true. OK. So what do we have so far in this talk? We have a sort of getter hit setter hierarchy. We have a single value. And to put something inside that value, we call the setter. To take things out, you call the getter. And then you have a deferred or value in the future, a promise. To put things in, you call the resolver. To take things out, you call you use the denable. And then you have a collection or something with possibly a finite end or you know, a way of signaling termination. To put things in, you use the generator. To take things out, you use the iterator. Now. I'm going to be talking a little bit about properties of these things. So like, OK, so we have all of these things. And you know, um, what, make, what are some emergent properties for them? Um, I'm going to talk about a specific one in, in the literature. It's known as laziness and eagerness. Let's begin with our simple value. So when we have just like our object, we have a con we have our same config thing, and we have a get config function. Now, what's what can be said here is that functions are lazy. No code inside of get config will run until we run it, until we say, OK, it's your turn. Um, but values are just sort of always there. You declare a value, it's there. You don't, it doesn't wait for anything, doesn't lie around, doesn't wait until somebody uses config. If you just put this thing here, this const config equals blah, 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 it'll be there. Val the value will be there. Now, no, nothing inside of this function will happen until you call get config. Now, what about promises? Are promises lazy or eager? So in this case, we have, we have a promise. We put in a resolver. And so I really try to make things unordered. Like, is it is does ketchup go before mayo in sorting? I don't know. Anyway, um, so yeah, we have all of this and we resolve before. So is this lazily produced or eagerly eagerly produced? Is it like a value and it tries to get four as soon as possible? Or it's like a function, and only when for is needed is it produced. Think about it for a second. Like small dance moment while you think. So the sort of answer is that promises are eager. 
uh, when you have this, when you have the resolver, the promise calls the resolver immediately. So catch up is logged and then mail. Okay, so let's look at, let's put this on a table, let's put this on an axis. So we have things that are spatial or in temporal. So things that are of the now, like present tense, and things in the future tense. Then you have things that are like immediately try to get a value, like an object or like four. Things that are more chill, like only when you need them would they be used. So we know that a value is something that is immediately computed in the present tense. And a function is something that is lazily computed in the present tense. And a promise or a deferred is something that is uh, eagerly produced somewhere like in the future, is, is eagerly produced now, but you only get the value in the future. What's in this fourth quadrant? What's over here? Can you think of anything? It's okay if you came out of a blank since this is technically cheating and it doesn't exist in JavaScript. I'm gonna call it a task. So a task is something which models future actions. In this case, uh, we imagine a task constructor which sort of, which re sort of re also receives this resolver it is exactly the same code, except we swapped promise with task. Now, the difference is that nothing, like only mayo is logged. Ketchup is not logged, ever, because nothing uses this. It's not needed. It's like our get config. Nobody called it. If nobody called it, it won't do any work. Only if we put this in, will we get back our four. Only when we put this, will our task call the resolver and begin like trying to get a value out. I'm gonna do a small caveat and say that um, you know um, when promises are sort of uh, they have a standard. There's promises a plus. Now tasks are like one way of doing this, or like one way of calling this fit. There could be many names for it, just like futures or promises, or whatever. I chose task for this specific thing. There are implementations of task which, for example, are eager, but are different than promises in other ways and other properties. For example, unicast and multicast. I'm doing it for the sake of, you know, like, oh, I saw this task implementation, then task is a name that I use in this case for sort of lazy promise. What I would like to uh, be hung up about hung up about is the task re received this resolver, which looks exactly the same as a resolver for the promise. And the denable also looks exactly the same. So we have these two things, which you only switch in task and promise to you know, model if you want this lazily or eagerly. And everything else is the same. Now let's look at um, a different axis, not time, but space. So we have something, a single thing, a single thing now is a value. A single thing, you know, lazily now is a function. What's a lot of things now? What's like a bunch of things now? It's sort of an array, right? Like an array, a dictionary, a map, hash map, linked list, all of those collections that you have are just just right now. Um, but what's a lot of things that are, you know, only done when necessary, or only computed when necessary? So that's our generator. A uh, something is only done when it's needed. Like only when you call the next function will anything be actually done. Okay, so zooming back out, we have a single value now and, to, and taking this sort of, you know, these two axes that we had, putting them together, we sort of have a single value. Now we can call a value and a bunch of stuff 
now we can call you no know, collection. And a single thing sometime in the future is a promise. And a lot of things in the future is what's in the fourth quadrant. So I'm going to call it stream. Uh, it can be an observable, it can be an async iterator. It can be like, it has sort of like collection has a lot of names and promise can be deferred or a task has a lot of names. For example, if you remember our first uh, uh, setter of setters example, we had read file and add event listener that also fits in a lot of things sometime in the future. We're not going to talk about streams now since it's a can of worms. And this is, a, um, this is sort of the tip of the iceberg. I hope this interested you. Um, if you want to read more about this, uh, people who are way smarter than me wrote a lot of very smart things. Chris Kowal is awesome. He has a wizard hat. Andrew Stoltz did a lot of awesome work. Eric Mayer is amazing, and he has the most awesome t-shirts. He's sort of the you know grandfather of all this. And Ben Lesh, shameless pandering, uh, also wrote a few awesome things about it. Um, yeah, I work at a company named Defense Solutions. We take over drones. If that's interesting to you, talk to me. I'm hiring. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope this interested you, made you go, huh, and not like, huh? Uh, do read more about this. I think it's interesting, you know, either to see alternatives or just no more. And if you have any questions, yeah.